On the evening of 15 September 1945, Anton Weben stepped out of his daughter's house in Mittersil, Austria. It was a moment he had been looking forward to for days. The composer had managed to get himself a brand new American cigar, not easy to come by as the Third Reich lay in ruins. And he couldn't wait to savor at least a few puffs. Unbeknownst to him, however, there was an American army operation going on at that very moment. Ironically, it was aimed at his own son-in-law, who was suspected, rightly, of running a black market. An American soldier involved in the operation was startled by Weben's sudden appearance and fired three shots before he could realize he was dealing with an innocent civilian. Private Raymond Norwood Bell of Mount Olive, North Carolina, would spend the rest of his life battling feelings of guilt and remorse. He drank himself to death ten years later. Arnold Schoenberg died in circumstances that were just as tragic and bizarre. He had a lifelong fascination with numbers and their deep hidden meanings. The number 13 both obsessed and frightened him. He considered it unlucky and avoided, if he possibly could, all things having the number 13, whether it be hotel rooms, street addresses, or something for sale at 13 Deutschmark, you name it. By his understanding, he was born unlucky on the 13th of September, and he had a premonition that he would also die on the 13th day of some month. So he feared any day that was numbered 13, especially if it was a Friday. His anxieties rose to high tide when he reached the age of 76. That age was almost as unlucky as the age of 13, since 7 plus 6 equals 13. At that age, and with that phobia, he had much to fear from Friday the 13th of July 1951. He sank in deep depression as the date approached and spent the day itself in bed. He died of a heart attack at 13 minutes to midnight. At this time, 1951, Schoenberg lived in Los Angeles, an American citizen. He had emigrated to the United States in the same year that the Nazis came to power in Germany, 1933. Within a short time, he had been offered a professorship at UCLA, and he bought a home in Brentwood Park. Composers and musicians from all over the free world came to visit him as a celebrity. There are still home movies from that period, now kept in the Library of Congress. Schoenberg had made a timely escape from Germany, and he owed his life to the hospitality of the American people. That did not put a special obligation on him, at least not once he had become a U.S. citizen. But you wonder to what extent he saw his emigration to the United States as an opportunity to broaden his musical horizons and engage with American musical traditions. Perhaps you could even say that he had a responsibility to do so. The 1930s were a calamitous decade for the American people who struggled through the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl years. As we will see later on, American composers felt that this was perhaps the time to put their most radical experimentations on the back burner and do what they could as musicians to uplift the American people, to affirm their heritage to give them music inspired by shared cultural traditions. But this recent book, which claims to blow away many misconceptions about Schoenberg in America, only confirms what I suspected. As a composer, Schoenberg 
continued to live in a bubble of Germanness. It was as if he had never moved. That was his loss, but perhaps not entirely his fault. Germany and Austria had dominated the European musical scene throughout the 19th century, just as these countries had also dominated the worlds of science and humanist scholarship. Their cultural superiority was an uncontested fact. From Schoenberg's point of view, what could America boast? We know the answer is a lot. But the problem was that the classical tradition had been isolating itself from all other musical traditions. It viewed itself as the only tradition that was fully devoted to the art of music for its own sake. It pursued that art with great piety, without distraction, without the interference of the unschooled, without diluting the art for the base purpose of entertainment. It seemed natural to look upon popular musical traditions with the same disdain as a professor of medical science would look upon traditional home remedies. This would prove to be a problem for classical devotees in America. By the end of the 19th century, faced with the overpowering might of the German symphonic tradition, American philanthropists got together and started funding concert halls, opera theaters, conservatories, symphony orchestras, music departments with specialized music libraries. Here is one building that resulted from these efforts, Carnegie Hall in New York City. Carnegie Hall had not always been dwarfed by the skyscrapers surrounding it today. It started out as the most impressive landmark in that part of New York. Impressive in terms of its size at any rate. The architectural design seems more appropriate for a bank, or maybe a courthouse or a city hall. Yet for all the expenses lavished on this and other buildings, the only repertoire that was ever played or studied or written about was European, usually German. Would America one day be able to claim its own great composer? But what would make his music sound distinctively American? When it came to the classical tradition, that seemed almost a contradiction in terms. The only distinctively American musical sounds were popular. Ragtime, the minstrel show, the banjo, the so-called Negro spirituals, Native American music, folk songs among the poor rural whites. Yet it is here at Carnegie Hall on 15 December 1893 that Americans, or at least affluent Americans, were filled with new hope that it might after all be possible for America to speak to the world with an American classical musical voice. We turn now to the music critic of the daily newspaper, The New York Herald, who attended the event and describes it vividly. It was essentially a ladies' day. The philharmonic rehearsals always are. But yesterday in particular, Carnegie Hall seemed to contain nothing but the members of the fairer sex. The downpour of rain could not keep them away. At half past three, there were small groups of enthusiastic admirers of the Philharmonic, of music, and of Dr. Dvorak, scattered about the great hall, chatting merrily. Outside, there was a long line of tardy ticket purchases. Each individual in the row, which stretched down the steps and along 57th Street, impatiently tried to push forward his immediate predecessors. The ushers rushed to and fro, and heartily tired of it all, they looked long before the concert began. Here is that issue of the New York Herald, published the next day. And here is the review itself, complete with a drawing of the event. The headlines say it all. Dr. Dvorak, Great Symphony, from the New World, heard for the first time at the Philharmonic rehearsal about the salient beauties. First movement, the most tragic. Second, the most beautiful. Third, 
the most sprightly. And then comes the key point. Inspired by Indian music, the director of the National Conservatory adds a masterpiece to musical literature. Now we join the reviewer into the concert hall itself, and he continues to tell us what was going on. There was an air of excitement pervading everyone. People read and reread the analytical notes accompanying the program. I am sure that the lady next to me must have known by heart that, quote, Dr. Dvorak made a study of Indian and Negro melodies and found them possessed of characteristics peculiarly their own. That, quote, he identified himself with their spirit, made their essential contents, not their formal external traits, his own, and that he had striven, quote, to reproduce in the present symphony the fundamental characteristics of the melodies, which he had found here by means of the specifically musical resources which the inspiration furnished. At last, the moment arrives. Mr. Seidel, the director, mounts the platform. There is a moment of expectancy. Every eye is on the uplifted baton. It descends, and we are listening at last to Dr. Dvorak's symphony from the New World. the review really gets started. We get a vivid description of the first movement blow by blow. Readers at the time did not have the luxury of being able to hear the symphony while they were reading. But we do, so let's read the description and hear what the reviewer describes. What do we hear? A sad, tragic unison theme in E minor given out by the cellos. Dark, somber, threatening. The horns throw an instant's flash of color into the scene. Then it is gone, and the woodwinds are deepening the feeling of melancholy which the opening passage has created. The strings become more vigorous. The kettle drums answer sharply, harshly, savagely. Gloom, deep as darkest night, created by a long passage for the contrabasses. Slowly the movement begins to be more animated.
The woodwinds, the strings, everything seems to be on the alert. There is a series of crashing chords, followed by a long roll upon the drum. Then, over a tremolo in the strings, the first theme is given out by the horns. And the first movement has commenced in real earnest. What the spirit of Indian music may be, I do not know. If this movement, which is now going on, breathes the genuine native atmosphere, then certainly the future of music is in the hand of the red man. And then a series of passages ushers in a delicate plaintive melody wailed forth by the flute and accompanied by easy flowing counterpoint. And here is the composer of that symphony, Antonin Dvorak. He came from Bohemia, deep in Central Europe. As a composer, he had faced the same problem that Americans did, the overpowering dominance of the German symphonic tradition, and yet also a sense that the music of his country should celebrate its national spirit. He had found a solution by listening to Bohemian folk songs and adapting them to the classical idiom. His experience made him ideally suited to help young American composers to forge a similar national style. The Symphony of the New World of 1893 was meant to give an example of how it could be done. We just saw from the newspaper headline that it incorporated Native American music. In a few moments, we will hear that it also quotes African-American folk song. Dvorak had set a powerful example. If a European composer can do that, then surely Americans could too. The idea to bring Dvorak to America and to invite him to teach composition to young Americans came from Jeanette Thurber. She was a wealthy philanthropist who had lavished much of her wealth on the foundation of a conservatory of music. Here it is, the National Conservatory of Music in New York, sadly no longer in existence. Dvorak was offered a teaching position at this conservatory. In fact, the newspaper headlines described him as its director. Dvorak had made a long journey by train and then by boat across the Atlantic to take up his position. Obviously, this drew the attention of the New York press, which reported enthusiastically on his activities and soon asked for an interview with the great man. The illustrations show him teaching an American composer, a woman. The founder of the conservatory had progressive ideals and emphatically insisted that the school be a training ground for women, African Americans, and other ethnic minorities, as well as men. It was not long until the great master himself ventured his opinions on American music, its future and its potential, in a newspaper interview. The headlines say it all. Real value of Negro melodies. Dr. Dvorak finds in them the basis for an American school of music, rich in undeveloped themes. American composers urged to study plantation songs and build upon them. Uses of Negro minstrelsy, college students to be admitted to the National Conservatory, 
prizes to encourage Americans. So, what were his opinions? I can only quote selected excerpts, but they soon reveal a perspective that is not nearly as isolationist as that of German composers like Schoenberg and others. I am now satisfied, says Dvorak, that the future music of this country must be founded upon what are called the Negro melodies. These must be the real foundation of any serious and original school of composition to be developed in the United States. They are the folk songs of America, and your composers must turn to them. Among my pupils at the National Conservatory of Music, I have discovered strong talents. There is one young man upon whom I've been building strong expectations. His compositions are based upon Negro melodies, and I have encouraged him in this direction. The other members of the composition class seem to think that it is not in good taste to get ideas from the old plantation songs. But they are wrong, and I have tried to impress upon their minds the fact that the greatest composers have not considered it beneath their dignity to go to the humble folk songs for motives. When the Negro minstrels are here again, I intend to take my young composers with me and have them comment on the melodies. Those were bold statements, and Dvorak would soon find that they were not received with universal enthusiasm. Persons of taste and education and culture considered the blackface minstrel show a most vulgar kind of entertainment. These shows had been going on since the 1850s and they were tremendously popular. It is now inconceivable, or at least would be inconceivably offensive, to blacken one's face in, in imitation of fellow Americans. If you're going to make fun of anybody, make fun at your own expense, or at the expense of politicians. They are fair game. Maybe professors too, I don't know. So what made these shows so funny? It was the way white performers stereotyped African Americans, presenting them essentially as clowns, with skits and songs, and the illusion that this was the kind of thing that went on, or had gone on, on southern, southern plantations. Here's a sample of a blackface minstrel song, complete with fake African American accent, recorded in 1896, a mere three years after the premiere of the New World Symphony. Oh my, oh my, my coon blood will soon be abide And oh my, oh my, that nigga must resign his head Else by his tune, that his good looks I'll soon be abide And I'll make that black gal mine Ah, oh, nigga, there you is again You said me of a scandal of banjo fever Well, if you don't come on whistling, Ruth Hello, Ruth Hello, boy, hello Get in, Ruth, get in Dvorak's idea of having minstrel shows invade the dignified and serious world of classical music was considered outrageous by some commentators. An example is Edward McDowell, an American composer and piano virtuoso who had been trained in German. His early piano concertos had impressed audiences in America, and he was soon expected to become the great American composer that everybody was hoping for. But that hope had not come to fulfillment. McDowell preferred to write poetic short pieces, not symphonies. He had disappointed, like an author who is expected to write the great American novel, but ends up writing short stories instead. McDowell seems to have been really irked by Dvorak holding forth. He had devoted his life to the cause of American classical music, and here was this foreigner from Bohemia who knew nothing of America and presumed within months that he had it all figured out. So McDowell wrote 
an opinion piece in response. Let's hear what he had to say. We have here in America been offered a patent for an American national music costume by the Bohemian Dvorak. What Negro melodies have to do with Americanism still remains a mystery to me. Why cover a beautiful thought with the badge of slavery, rather than with the stern but at least manly and free roughness of the North American Indian? Masquerading the so-called nationalism of Negro clothes cut in Bohemia will not help us. What we must arrive at is the youthful optimistic vitality and the undaunted tenacity of spirit that characterizes the American man. It had been hard for African Americans to win respect for their musical traditions, but they did succeed internationally with the so-called Negro spirituals. These were traditional African American songs on religious themes that were arranged in the style of classical oratorios. The first group to go on tour with the repertoire of spirituals shortly after the end of the Civil War were the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Their picture alone is a statement. Plenty of white folk knew no better than, than that African Americans really were clowns like they had laughed at so much in the theater. Often they treated them like they were truly were clowns. African Americans soon found that white people were a lot easier to deal with if you went along with that stereotype for the duration of the interaction. Insisting on your human dignity could get you in trouble. This is part of what W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about in his classic monograph, The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903. He had spoken of a double consciousness. On the one hand, there is the African American that white folk like to see, and on the other, the African American who can be disentangled from that prejudice only with the greatest difficulty. So yes, this picture is a statement. Unfortunately, it didn't stop concert managers from promoting them in the newspapers as, quote, real life darkies, meaning that they offered something like a minstrel show. Let's hear a short sample of the so-called Negro spirituals, the famous song, Swing Low, Sweet Cherio. It is important in this context because Dvorak quoted the melody in the symphony of the new world. When Dvorak spoke in his interview of a very promising African-American student in composition, he meant Harry T. Burley. Burley had been writing compositions based on African-American themes well before Dvorak visited America. Here's a short sample of his setting of Swing Low. And here is how Dvorak incorporated the same song in his symphony.
But what did African Americans think of all this back and forth about their music between white folk? For this, we have to read African American newspapers. Their voice was not typically heard in the white press. Opinions varied. This short article from the Cleveland Gazette praised Dvorak for his initiative and took satisfaction in the recognition of African American musical traditions. There is no question in our mind but that Dr. Dvorak is on the right track for the simple reason that about all the truly American music we have is furnished in these very same Negro melodies. And if large and important musical works with a distinctively American characteristic running throughout are to be had at any time within the next 50 or 100 years, it is absolutely necessary that they, the melodies, be drawn upon for the themes or other foundations of the new musical creations. It was the new Afro-American characteristic which attracted such crowds in Europe among which were the leading musicians, to hear our jubilee singers, and it is the secret of their success abroad. And they continue. The Negro melodies were new, peculiar, and attractive in other countries because of their marked originality. The Indian has bequeathed us practically nothing in a musical line and white Americans have been too busy borrowing from the works of foreigners to create or originate themes upon which to build the future music of this country. If, therefore, we are ever to have an American school of music, it is absolutely necessary, as Dr. Dvorak says, that the folk songs furnished by our people while in the toils of slavery be drawn upon for the foundation of any serious and original school of composition to be developed in this country. And yet there is such a thing as dignity, and while praise is welcome, it can or can be felt as condescending. In the same year, 1893, there was this article in the periodical The Free Man. The author in principle approves of Dvorak's words, but also points out that in some ways, Dvorak is merely a positive version of McDowell. It is a rather curious thing, by the way, that we needed Dvorak to tell us what we have known very well during the past 40 years. Negro music is the sweetest music in the world. Dr. Dvorak's discovery is a trifle late in the day, but if it brings the musicians at least to a contemplation, of the great musical genius of the Negro, it cannot fail to accomplish some good. This concludes the first part of lecture 24. This part is exactly three quarters of the whole lecture, so there is another installment upcoming. It will begin with one of the most disastrous events in the history of Princeton University. This is the Yale Princeton football game of 1898 which ended in a humiliating defeat for the Tigers. Believe it or not, a Yale undergraduate celebrated the victory with an orchestral composition. Like Dvorak, he quoted various American themes, including Princeton's very own anthem, Old Nassau. Stay tuned. Thank you. 